Today, my wife and I owned an RV-12 IS. Once upon a time, I owned a Grumman TR-2. Sitting back now and looking at the two planes, I think there's some interesting parallels in their development and some traits that make them birds of a feather. In this video, I'll explain what I mean by that. But first, let's take a little side trip into history. Throughout the ages, there are people who become icons in their own era. Whether it's through shrewd marketing, media coverage, or word of mouth, certain people just acquire an aura of excellence within their area of work. For example, there's one of my personal favorites, Kelly Johnson. If you don't recognize his name, then surely you'll recognize the planes he's designed. From the P-38 to the F-104, the U-2 spy plane, and the SR-71. He is the fabled leader of the Skunk Works at Lockheed Aircraft Company. Nobody better represents the advancement of modern aviation than Kelly does. Have you heard of Jim Beatty? Many people credit him for starting the genre of kit planes. He designed the BD-1, 2, 3, 4, and the BD-5, shown here. The BD-5 was so cool that James Bond flew it to escape the bad guys in the movie Octopussy. And then there's Burt Rutan. Actually, Burt worked for Jim Beatty for a while before he had branched off on his own. Burt pioneered the building of light aircraft by laying composites over a foam core to create complex shapes. He is known for designing a number of kit planes, including the Very Easy and the Long Easy, pictured here. He founded the company Scaled Composites, which has the charter of building flyable scale models for research purposes. Wind tunnel testing is fine, but what if you could build a one-third scale model of a design and actually fly it as part of a development cycle? He's also known for building the Voyager, the first and only aircraft to fly non-stop and unrefueled around the world. Now, because this channel is devoted to RB12 stuff, how can we forget Richard Van Grunsven? He has been prolific as a designer, releasing kit planes from the RV-3 to the RV-15, skipping only the RV-13 in between. He has sold over 18,000 kits, with over 7,500 of them completed and flying today. Those numbers come from Wikipedia and are probably outdated as of now. So let's look at this RV-12 that Richard designed. He had the challenge to not only make the design simple for the home builder to assemble, but he had to make it light enough to qualify as a light sport aircraft. Part of the weight challenge was satisfied by the use of a lighter gauge aluminum. I appreciate other engineering solutions he worked into the design. For example, designing in a flaperon not only reduced the parts to assemble, but simplified the mechanism for aileron travel and flap travel. Choosing a Hershey bar profile for the wings simplified the build by having all the ribs be the same. The horizontal stabilizer is a one-piece construction rather than two stabilizers and two elevators. To make assembly easier for the home builder, Richard designed it so that the wings are removable and easier to fabricate in a garage or a hangar. The aerodynamics of the RV-12 are such that the plane cuts through the air with very little drag. It literally doesn't want to land. It knows that it belongs in the sky. Do you remember I mentioned Jim Beatty earlier? He designed the plane marketed as the Grumman AA-1B TR-2. Or rather, he designed the BD-1 from which the Grumman evolved. BD wanted to provide a kit plane that was simple in construction that could be built and stored in a garage at home. The original BD-1 had folding wings to allow easy build at home and trailering to the airport. The folding wings did not survive the transition to the Grumman, however. The cockpit enclosure is made of a bonded honeycomb sandwich that is surprisingly lightweight but incredibly strong. The wing skins are bonded to the ribs, so no rivets are used in construction. The wing spars are hollow tubes that double as the fuel tanks. To further simplify construction, the vertical and horizontal stabilizers are all interchangeable, as are the rudder and elevators. Side by side, you can see the similarities in the planform design of these two aircraft. 
They both started out as home-built kits, and both have been hugely successful in their time, which is why I call them birds of a feather. So here's how the two planes compare. Both similar canopies, 2 by 2 seating, and castoring nose gear. Physical dimensions are somewhat close until you get to the wing area. I can tell you from experience that the Grumman with its high wing loading will sink like a rock with power off. Fly the final faster and keep the power on is what you do. In contrast, the RV-12 wants you to slow down on final, else you'll overshoot your intended landing point. I like to shoot approaches at 70 knots until short final, when I slow to 60 knots until crossing the threshold. Now the RV-12 beats the Grumman at cruise and range. In fact, one reason I sold my TR-2 is because I found it so limited in range that it was not a good cross-country plane. As a time builder, though, it's a good choice for a novice pilot looking for a fun aircraft that's reasonably priced and cheap to operate. In closing now, as we look at the specific airplanes that I personally owned, in a sample interior of each, I have a request to make. This is the 21st video I've made. I'm trying to get better with each one, and I benefit from comments you make. Let me know what you like and what you don't like. Suggest topics you'd like to see, and I'll try to work them in. Until then, subscribe if you haven't already. It's one of the few things you get for free these days. I hope to see you again in a future video.